Am I on? Thanks a million, Ursula, and thanks so much to Magico team for having me. I'm ex-Magico, so, so I know some of you from those days, um, so I've been coming to the summit for the last number of years, and it's always a great day, so it's lovely to see some familiar faces and then new faces as well, so I hope you're all having a great day. Um, super interesting, mind-blowing, the future of the machines, but I'm going to talk about the people, uh, back to the humans, because what I'm going to talk about today is creating winning content and the marketing to reach uh, our customers and reaching those customers above the noise, above all the other uh, noises out there from brands, from organizations, from their own busy, busy lives, uh, even their own watches, as mine just rang there when I was on the way up. Um, so why do we need to try and beat the noise and reach our customers above a busy noise? Um, and I suppose it's just the reality of modern living. Like, this is before all of our time, obviously, but we can all remember a time where communication from brands and organization was one to many. You sat down, you watched the Late Late Tower Show, you know, the whole country watched at the same point on time and consumed the same marketing messages. And that was the way it used to be, you know, singular media, television, radio, and print. And we received that in a one to many relationship with brands and organizations. But that has changed, and I don't know how many people. This, this resembles their house in the evening, particularly if there's teenagers around. Um, but we don't engage with brands and organizations like that anymore. We've got multiple devices. It's a one-to-one -one relationship with brands and organizations. Um, we're engaging on our phones, our laptops, our TVs, terrestrial television, digital, streaming, um, you know, social media, gaming. That's all happening under the same roof and often multi-devices at the same time. Um, so that's a bombardment of noise and messaging and, you know, sometimes that's good. I could buy, buy something on uh, Instagram without even realizing sometimes in the evening and I could be watching TV at the same time. But by and large, it creates a challenge for, for marketers to get your message across um, a busy, busy uh, marketplace. So how do we reach those people? And first things first, do we know who they are? Do we know who our customers are? Are we spending time? thinking about those humans and, you know, people who are um, omnichannel retailers in the room who have a store and are online as well, you'll know those faces really well from who comes into your store and you've got a picture of who, you know, that person roughly is. But for your online store, are you really thinking about who that customer is and how does that differ maybe from your offline store and who are the, the categories and the personas and the cohorts within that customer base? In terms of knowing your customer, I suppose, who is your customer, that's the whole point around, you know, as I say, what cohort do they belong to? Um, you know, are, what are the differences? Are they people with us in the same family? Uh, what age are they? How much disposable income do they have? Um, and, you know, how often do they shop with you? Who is that person? Secondly, from a marketing perspective, and this is really critical, what do they want to hear about? Um, you know, I suppose we've all been there, and retailer side, I would have been there as well. You're crafting your marketing messages, and you've got your outlet sale, for example, like as someone mentioned earlier, the Arnott's warehouse sale is on at the moment. Um, does everybody want to hear that? Does everybody want to hear about that particular, you know, sales event? Or maybe there's a more premium customer who's never going to be interested in that particular message. Or I suppose for the pharmacy retailers who have multiple beauty brands, if you've got your Clarence lady who loves Clarence and doesn't want to hear about anything else, does she? care that there's a new drop from the inky list or, or whatever it is. So thinking about what that customer wants to hear about um, is really critical to reaching them. And then what marketing channels do they favor? And I suppose we could have a traditional view on this as well, that you know a younger person's gonna be on social and an older person just wants to see the print ad in the local paper at the weekend. Um, but you've got, I suppose, to look at the data and understand the cohorts of your customer again and really think about what channels they're likely to be using, using the data because all of the data suggests about an older audience that they're more socially, social media conscious and aware than we actually realize. So looking at your data, looking at your Google Analytics, where is the customer coming from? What channels are converting will really help you make decisions around the marketing channel mix that you uh, use to get your marketing messages out. And then lastly, are you future-proofing your audience? And this is, I suppose, when we really think back to the humans, who are the people, who are the people that are engaging with our brands and our marketing messages? You know, you could have obviously a legacy relationship with a person who's always shopped in your store. And you could have, I suppose, over time, you know, built that audience to include their family. And suppose, what's, what's the future for that? Um, you know, we all want to, 
you know, maintain our, our audience bases and make sure that we are, you know, future proofing, but sometimes it can be daunting to reach a younger audience. Um, so what are we doing to future proof that audience? Um, and I suppose this is a very, I suppose, typical Western marketing way of looking at the age profiles, and we're not gonna do any show of hands as to who belongs to what cohort in this room, but the typical, I suppose, way of looking at the audience profile in, in, in modern marketing, you've got the baby boomers, which is a horrible term, really, but it's how these people are, are categorized. It's the people who were born between 1946 and 1964, so thought to be the, typically the, the post-World War II generation, the baby boom that came after that, who were the first teenagers that were marketed to, the first, I suppose, college students, the first uh, suburbia residents, the first to own a credit card. Um, and I suppose for a lot of maybe of our businesses here, that financially secure, stable customer makes up a, you know, potentially a big, a big part of your base. Um, they've also saved for retirement. They're more likely to have been in a job for life. Um, and they, you know, they have got that disposable income. So how do you talk to that person versus, versus another? The next is Generation X. So this is, I suppose, 1965 to 1980, roughly. Um, this is, I suppose, the next generation. They call this the slacker generation, which also isn't very nice, but the first people to, I suppose, reject the norms of their parents to em embrace grunge and alternative rock um, and alternative lifestyles to be a little bit more anti-establishment. Um, Still quite financially secure and conscious, still, I suppose, less likely to bounce around jobs, um, but early adopters of technology, early adopters of the internet, um, and these people, I suppose, are, they did the bulk of their earning, I suppose, before COVID and the last few years of instability, so that's a pot that have, in theory, money to spend. Next, then, you have millennials, roughly 81 to 80, uh, 95. Um, this is, I suppose, you know, in the last few years, the big cohort that everyone would have talked about a lot in marketing terms, how to reach them. These are the people that came of age around the millennium, so grew up and experienced the internet, the first Bebo users, the first Napster and Limeware downloaders. There's a load of them in here. I can see you all nodding. Um, you know, pe these people, I suppose, remember 9-11. They remember the change in the world to, you know, maybe a more polarized um, world that we live in um, and are, I suppose, very brand uh, and organization sensitive as a result. Heavy social media users, um, perhaps not as financially stable as generations previous. So these are the three ones that everybody, I suppose, knows about and probably make up the bulk of who, you know, most brands would target at, you know, um, at present. But in terms of the next pot, Gen Z, these are the 1996 to mid-2000s guys. So these are obviously entering your workforce now, obviously probably some of them in the room as well. And the differences here, I suppose, is different things matter to these people. They're digital natives from day dot. They've grown up with the internet. They've grown up with online shopping. Um, they are, uh, they do have money, but it's less of a secure money picture. It's not a job for life with this cohort. They're more likely to be digital nomads. I think Andrea gave me that term earlier, where you can work from anywhere. You could be in your cafe in Bali and doing your job, your, you know, your, your part-time gig and managing social media for someone on the other side of the world. So this cohort are more flexible. They are more socially conscious as well. They're more likely to be in, uh, interested in sustainability um, and have a social conscience, anti-war, all of that. Um, so thinking about this cohort, what actually matters to them? Like when you take that back to retail and you think about this type of person, you know, sustainable packaging, green messaging, that's all going to be really important. Um, flexibility is really important to this audience. So they're used to buy now, pay later, those types of facilities for, um, for actual payment. Um, and service is really important to them as well. So when they buy something, they expect to get it like that. Um, and then the next terrifying, terrifying creature is the, the Gen Alphas. So born after 2013, we've all, we all know these. Shouting at you from the back seat. Hey, sorry, play Jingle Bells. I've got one. Um, but so the Gen Z, Gen Alpha are, this is obviously the future. So the last two cohorts, they'll obviously mature into their, their preferences for consumerism, but you know, important to look at them. You know, this is a true digital native. This is the baby that could use the, the iPhone with the finger before you even, you know, made you realize how intuitive technology is. Um, these guys, I suppose, know no different from the internet. They're, um, entire experience of brands will be on the internet. They're heavily influenced by, um, by TikTok and, and YouTube, so it's a video experience for these kids. They're using their parents' phone, they're influencing parents' 
purchasing decisions, particularly in the beauty category. So for pharmacies, you'll know obviously all about that with them. Um, you know, the influence around the premium skincare that the, the tiny, tiny tots can, can influence. My eight-year-old niece, um, the amount of skincare she got from Santi was, was, was something else, and that's influence from her. Um, and you'll see that the skincare brands are actually running, you know, influencer trips now that are mom influencers, you know, for want of a better term. You know, people who have, who's, who's influencing can influence other parents that can in turn purchase for these people. So that is, I suppose, those are all traits and they're all, you know, facts about, about those groups of people, but they're all consumer insights that we can use as marketers um, when we're thinking about the cohort that we want to reach um, with our marketing. So that's, the, I suppose, the, the people um, and thinking about who the audience is, but then how do we reach those audiences and how do we, as retailers and as marketers, make that as easy as possible for our side, for, the, for the, the creation side, and make it sustainable for our businesses to maintain your creativity and, and deliver um, marketing messages that actually resonate. Um, if, you've, if I've ever talked to you before, this will be no, surpri no surprise, my number one key for this is forward planning is key to success. So with your marketing, Planning out your campaigns is just is the key to success because you can target who you're going to reach. You can maintain your creativity and have the proactive time to plan so you'll have better ideas um, and you'll be better able to react when something comes up that you want to react to, like something like a tactical. So for your campaigning, you need to plan ahead. It's hard. I don't even do enough of it myself for my own business, but I know it's the right thing to do, so we definitely should be doing it. And plan through the line, plan every channel. And if you're, if you're working to a plan in a calendar, you're actually better able to do that because if you know Valentine's Day is coming up or it's Easter weekend and you've got your campaign concept, you know, and you've got those number of weeks to plan for it, you can work out what you're gonna do in email. Your work, you can work out what you're gonna do in social. You know, you can plan through the channels and plan through the line. We used to talk about above the line and below the line, but now there's no line. It's just, I suppose marketing is omnipresent. Um, and you know, sometimes you'll have a really good piece of social content, and this happens all the time. And you'll be thinking, God, I, I wish I should have got that out in an email as well. Or there'll be an event, and you, you know, you might have done stories on it. You might have um, maybe there's an event in store, and it's it particularly would suit one cohort, and you've done Insta stories on it. But you, you could have got it out in an email as well, um, you know, and had that multi-pronged approach. Um, so planning will help you get there. And then as Paul is an a advocate of use the available data. So with AB Commerce, you've got all that rich data on the actual platform. With Google Analytics, you've got also a lot of really useful information about your marketing referrals. Um, and within your marketing channels themselves, you've obviously got, particularly in social, and we're going to focus on social today, um, you've got the information there as to what your, your um, cohort are engaging with. So use that data and iterate accordingly. Like, you know, the platforms will tell you what the best time of the day to post is. You know, don't try and reinvent the wheel. Use the data that they're giving you. Um, you know, they'll tell you your male, female cohort. You'll know exactly, is it worth your while investing, you know, in a particular campaign for, for an audience that mightn't be there. So use the data. And then in terms of campaign types, when you're planning through the line, um, you know, you have the opportunity to then vary your campaign types up. So the first one, just to mention, is seasonal campaign. This is one from Birkenstock. Just a simple little campaign. Now this is a sponsored ad. And so some of these examples will be sponsored social, some will be organic social. And just to, um, I suppose, from a creativity perspective, that's a really nice one from a seasonal Valentine's Day message. And it clicks through, obviously, to the product. Um, Ecom trading, then this is the one not to forget about. There's not necessarily a promotion attached to it, but it's trading your categories. So if you've got a new drop on lawnmowers, you know, that's, you, that, you should be planning a campaign that's maybe not necessarily a promotion, but it's content rich and it's a trading campaign about that particular category. And again, going back to planning, when you plan for it, you can have breadth across your categories. And then the brand campaigns, you know, the nice content messages, like what is your brand about? Um, what's maybe not a hard sell, but it's something you want to tell your customers about. This is one from a brand I can never pronounce, Jojo Maman Bebe, I don't know, is that what you say? Um, this is a campaign that they do around um, Mother's Day and it's, it's, it's giving back um, to mothers in need because this is a children's wear brand. So that's a brand campaign, there's no hard sell there. 
Um, and that's important to kind of blend into your mix because the last thing you want to be doing is bombarding your customers with sales all the time. And it's very tempting, but it's better if you have a mix. Um, and particularly some of the retailers in the room, you've got multi-category uh, product ranges. You know, there's a lot of room for education there, be that hardware, be that pharmacy, be that, you know, retail. There's a lot of different things to talk about. Um, and then lastly, the good old tactical promos. You know, sometimes you need to switch these on quickly. This is just an art site, Decenio. You can buy prints. Um, you can switch these on quickly if you need, if you're about to get to the end of the month and you want to hit a certain target, you can switch on a tactical quickly. Or if you're planning to budgets and you know when you need to do them, even better because you can have them planned in ahead of time. So those are your campaign types. And what would I suggest that you do with those? I would say put them into a calendar and vary them up. So look at what your Ideally, you'd have your budget line across this and you'd know what numbers you're trying to hit, but you've got your campaign type, you know, this is very basic, I'd obviously have more of this happening per week in the month, but you're laying it all out ahead of time um, and you know exactly what you're doing and when. Something like a seasonal campaign, that's not going to change. We know when back to school is going to be. You know, you're going to know when Black Friday is. <laughs> so you're, you, there's no, you could plan your Black Friday on the 1st of January. Um, and and get ahead of it. So I would do that, plan them out, have your promotions or campaigns, and then add in whatever channels it is that you plan to do. So just have them planned. So your paid social, organic, social, email, Google, it could be an SMS campaign, it could be influencers, it could be print, it could be store events. Lay it all out there and it can be as basic as this and you can you know, just have a forward view um, and it just helps to spark the creativity and spark the ideas across the line. Um, so we're just going to spotlight on social for a minute, just in terms of creativity. And I think it's just, I suppose, a really kind of popular area in terms of where the creativity is, where the rubber meets the road, really, from campaigns being delivered to your customers. So we're just going to talk about that for a second. Um, and some advice for social media success in no particular order. These are just some advice points. First thing is be authentic. Um, and that means that what's going out on your social media needs to be authentic to who you are as a brand and who your customer perceives you to be. Now, it's okay to test and trial and expand on that, but it needs to be authentic to who you are. And we can even all, I suppose, think <coughs> off the top of our heads about sometimes influencers are involved with brands and it might not always be a great fit. Um, so that's really important to be authentic. Always put your customer first. Um, and what I mean by this is social media can be a wonderful uh, Customer helpline, what's the word for that? Customer service, um, and people will engage, you, engage with you there, so you need to be responding to them. You need to be at a base level responding to any questions and queries, but then also the next level of that is engagement. You know, if they're sharing and tagging you in, in stories, make sure you're engaging with that content, saying thank you, resharing it, hit them with the like. Like, it's all relationship building, and that, um, you know, that two-way relationship is it's almost what customers expect now. Keep consistent. Um, every day I turn on my phone and I've got an influencer saying, oh, I haven't been on here in a while. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't notice you were gone, but anyway. Um, so be consistent. If you've got your calendar, you can kind of make, work out your days, use the data to work out what those days and times should be, and try and keep consistent to that. Look at the data, same point, I guess. Um, don't forget to drive sales. On social, we can kind of sometimes get sucked into trends and sucked into what's coming next. and the latest hot topic, but sometimes we can forget about the sales, so don't forget to actually plan the promotions as well. Stay current. This is a really, really, really tough one because it's changing all the time, um, and this means that the people making the decisions need to understand the platforms and they need to stay current. And if it can't be you, and you don't want to be on TikTok, and you don't want to be looking at trends, maybe think about engaging somebody in the company or somebody external that is going to stay, you know, going to know about the trending signs on TikTok or the, you know, the fun trends that you should be leveraging. Um, and also what you could be starting to discontinue. Like if you're investing heavily, you know, for example, in Twitter, which is maybe losing that reach in Ireland, staying current will be helping you to make decisions around uh, your own effort and where you put your energies. Resource correctly. Um, this, I suppose, is true of digital marketing across the board. Do you have the correct resource internally to do the execution on the tasks? Do you have to engage, you know, particularly for specialist areas, do you have to engage agencies to give that support? And is it the bandwidth at all? You know, how are you going to do that? So resourcing is really important. 
and then use the tools. There's been a lot of talk about AI and it's amazing. It's so brilliant to hear like what people are actually really using. So there's obviously all that AI that's available. Um, and even kind of on a more basic level for your graphic design with Canva. If you haven't, uh, you know, if you're not using that, have a look at it. Um, but there are tools that are available to you. You know, you can keep it simple, but if there's something that can make life easier, use it. I think getting into content creation, sometimes this can be a trickle. It can be really hard sometimes to generate the ideas, or sometimes it can be a flow. So that's why the planning sessions are good, because you can get your team together and everyone can spark ideas. But it can be a challenge, particularly if you're doing it last minute, and you're like, well, what am I going to post about today? It can be painful. So um, you know, that, that, that can be a challenge. Um, so what we're going to cycle through the next little uh, few slides is some just some ideas and like everybody is doing, I suppose it's important to note, most brands are doing brilliant in social and generating loads of ideas and jumping on trends. So this is just to spark some ideas that might be useful to you. Um, so the first one, I suppose, around product retail um, with social is important to create cachet. So this is an example from an apparel brand, Cezanne. They're French kind of heritage, but they're, I don't, I, I'm not sure they're, they're, they're they're all over as well, England and here. Um, so they, what they do really well is that they pick a particular item and they follow it on through with multiple social formats. So this is an example of one particular cardigan and they name it Betty. And it's, have you met Betty is the first thing. So the first thing that you see is this, like, who's Betty? And it comes in like by 10, 15 colors. So the video content is all like, this is a must have. There's a little bit of French in there for their, his, for their heritage, but it positions this particular item as something of cachet, and that's possible to do in any category, by the way. It could be you know, a particular tool or whatever. It could be you know, the thing you absolutely need to have. And then they follow it through. So it follows you again on through, and they continue with this Have You Met Betty business. <laughs> then the creative changes, and they say, we asked our entire Cezanne team, and everybody has at least one Betty in the wardrobe. So you're starting to have that social proof of, OK, well, everybody, all these girls have got it. I need it as well. Um, but creating that cachet around the product and, and following through on social. You know, they obviously, these are sponsored ads, so they have that set up to target who has clicked on the first one. And then it comes on through to stories um, and where they're really positioning the cool factor, Paris Chic meets British cool. And this is a link through then to the Betty Cardigan. So like a holistic way of looking at it. And lastly, then they've obviously got the standard retargeting on social with the catalog where they're retargeting me with what I have actually clicked on. But the creating of the cachet, the copy is important there. It's the social kind of influence and social proof of other people like this. This is the piece to have. Um, and it's actually really impactful. And it is possible to do in any type of product, really, if you actually think about it. Next, then, customer reviews. This is really impactful from a social proof perspective. This is John Hanley, which is an Irish brand I love. Um, they uh, use this a lot with their reviews that come through, and this is obviously a really simple graphic. You can do that. You can go into Canva, you can pick a review, you select Insta Story and pick five star review, and it'll give you a template you can use. Then all you need to do is copy over your reviews from Trustpilot or Google Reviews or whatever it is, and that's just a really simple one, but it's very effective. You could feature newness in store. Um, this is an example from Arnott's which I think is brilliant because what they're doing, this is uh, an Insta story, or a reel actually. What they've done is they've opened up with the, the hook at the start, things to do in, in Arnott's, and then they've moved through the kind of points that they want you to actually experience in the store. It's such ready-made content. It's very lo-fi as well, as you'll see. That's done on someone's phone. And a lot of the data coming back from the platforms is that lo-fi content is more impactful than very polished high production video, which is good news if you don't want to spend a lot of money on high production video. So uh, content created with the phone, particularly in store, like, you know, that, that's really simple to do. That's just real technology and Instagram. You could do that on your phone, you could build it, you could post it, and, you know, it's not very complex, but a, a really nice um, content type. Trends and trending signs, this is huge. Obviously, if anybody is a TikTok user, you can see this bleeding out into all the other platforms from TikTok. And I suppose TikTok being video first, um, and so I suppose connected to popular music and to trending music, not even current popular music, but you know, songs of all genres and ages, something can really take off on TikTok, and it is the trend. Um, so jumping on that, 
is really popular for brands, but I would just asterisk that with approach with caution. You still need to do it mindful of all the other stuff about authenticity and all that. But this is know a good something? one. Do you know something? I might know something. I might nice. know something too. What's the thing you know? Oh no, I can't tell you and you tell me what you know. Well, I can't tell you what I know. Well then I can't tell you what I know. Okay, fine. <laughs> so that's a good one. That's Melly's that Irish brand. Um, they, I think, looks like their secret is they're opening in Kildare Village, I'm not sure. But um, the friends conversation between Rachel and Joey that, you know, they know Joey knows about Chandler and Monica. And that little conversation is just trending at the moment. In a month's time, that'll look old as the hills. But for today, that's, um, that's a, 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 a current trend. Um, so that point is quite connected to stay current and stay up to date. It's also really current to, um, connected to resource correctly, because if you can't, if, you, if you're not interested in that aspect, you need to have somebody in your team that is, that can see those little trends and, and you know, connect them to content ideas for your business. Then behind the scenes, like everybody who's got a store can do this. This is the MoMA in New York. They just have a lovely, it's just a really nice post. It really fits their brand. This couple met at MoMA 56 years ago in 1968, and then it has the story of the couple. They're just standing in front of a piece of art, and it's just it's so lovely for their brand. But that could be in any store. It could be, you know, it, it could be any little hook, but it's relevant to the people that come into the actual, uh, into, the, into the business or organization, um, and very simple to do. And again, you're the retailers, you'll know what these stories are as well for your own business, what would be possible. And then lastly, not lastly, but last kind of example, this really popular with TikTok and is also kind of bleeding over into Insta stories is hook content. And what I mean by that is the opening frame of the reeler story or TikTok has got three reasons. It's got that hook. So the, it could be three reasons X, it could be why you're not gaining followers. It's this provocative statement or a statement with an obvious follow on that engages the, the, the follower to stay on. This is from uh, Whoop, which is everywhere at the minute. And three reasons Whoop is the best fitness wearable on the market. Um, you know, you do stay with it, and that's a really popular trend at the minute. Really easy to do for retail. Like, I can think of loads of examples where, where that could cross over, you know, top three X, Y, or Z, or, you know, pose a, a, um, a provocative question to your audience and then follow up with the content. And I'm not going to subject you to this guy's video, <laughs> but it opens well, but yeah, we won't, we won't make you watch any more of him. Um, some other ideas then, uh, how to do X or Y, you know, if you've got a frequently asked question um, that you can answer, obviously working with influencers, unboxing videos, highlight an employee story, or your company story. Like those are just ideas to kind of spark off what you could do with, with, uh, with social content. Now there are, if you Google this, or if you, even, if you even search within the platforms, you know, content ideas, social content ideas, you'll get hundreds and hundreds of examples. So it's really about taking all those examples and filtering them back into your plan, your brainstorming in your own teams, your work with your agencies, um, and then work out what's right for your business. Some other tips and tricks, and some of them, I suppose, have been mentioned, and people are um, using them already, but stay up to date. We talked about that already. Um, use Canva. Like, it's super easy. You know, the graphic designers of the world probably aren't happy to hear about this, but um, it is super easy and will save you time and money. Leverage your brand partners and reps for assets. Now, this is really hard, because if you are waiting on, you know, like La Roche Posay, for example, to give you all of the assets for the new campaign for a vitamin C serum or whatever, you could be chasing them for that. But it's important to do that if you can and leverage those relationships because you know that's part of the work done for you. You know you've got the assets; you could, they're formatted already. You know, so chase the reps if you can uh, and get your assets. Again, search posting schedule for guideline posting schedules and prompts and content ideas. So. If you're saying, thinking to yourself, well, how much do I need to post? You can Google that and you'll have, you can get a sample post um, schedule or search it in Instagram even. You'll get post schedule, you get post prompts. Again, let's use the tools, use the resources that are out there um, to give you inspiration and a guideline for how much you could, should be posting. Consider using AI tools, which you talked about. This one, Predis.ai, is like a composite kind of chat GPT Canva thing where it actually builds the format for you. It's actually a paid one though, just to flag it. Um, don't overdo it on the hashtags. You know, the trend is kind of moving away from the big block of hashtags. Um, you know, for Instagram SEO, you know, you're trying to optimize 
so that people know what the, that the algorithm knows what your content's about, but don't overdo it. The, the current thinking is three to five hashtags is enough. Add UTM tracking to your click trees. We might be talking about social, which is all nice, but I'll still always think back to UTM tracking, which is the Google Analytics tracking code that you can put on your destination links. Particularly if you're doing your organic posts, you want to see what's driving click trees back to your site. So it's, if you're putting in a destination link on Facebook or your, um, your link sticker, just make sure you've got your UTM codes on the end of it. And I know if anybody is, doesn't know how to do that or whatever, I know Gillian can support with that. Um, but it just means that you can track in Google Analytics what posts are working. Or even at a very base level, you could track your Instagram profile page and your click through from the link in bio will be fully tracked. So worth thinking about. And then this, I, I think this is brilliant as a nerd, following the small business influencers and hashtags on social will give you the insights, ideas, tricks and trends. There's a really good girl down in Kerry called The Marketing Club. She's posting content all the time, tips and tricks for social. There's, other, there's loads of other ones, um, but worth having a look at that to see who's out there. Um, because it is changing all the time. And you can't be expected to be up to date across every aspect of everything. So if there's someone, um, you know, given those tips and tricks that you can follow, you know, you'll be following it in the moment on the platform as well, which is great. This is an example of a social media plan, um, just one that I would use. Um, it's kind of a variant on the calendar, but you've just got your promos across the top. You've got your platforms down the side. You've got your, I suppose, status. What type of post is it? What are the details? And then you've got caption linked to Canva. And that just helps then with, if there's a few people on the team working on it, you can look at what's coming up. If you need someone to approve it, they can hop in and look at the Canva link, look at the caption. And it's always good to get another pair of eyes on any content you're creating across any channel. So that's a sample. If anybody wants, I can send it to them. Um, and key takeaways. So just to reiterate from the top, um, know your customer. Plan ahead to maintain your creativity and hit your goals. And lastly, take the time to understand each channel or hire somebody who does. That's everything for me. Oh, we run over. <laughs>